Well, joining me in the studio to discuss this now, Talk TV's international editor, Isabel Oakeshott. Hello, Isabel. And down the line, John Boothman, political correspondent for The Times in Scotland. I might start with John, actually, because he's there, he's on the spot. John, I don't know what you make of this. Nicholas Sturgeon, you know, you might say sobbing, you might say snivelling. It really does depend on your perspective, I'm quite sure. And saying, you know, she really wishes she hadn't been uh, in charge during the pandemic. I just wonder what the point of that is. I mean, talk about, you know, crying over spilt milk, for goodness sake. She broke down a couple of times, Vanessa, uh, today, uh, just before lunchtime, when she was talking about... Well, she was asked about uh, whether or not political considerations had played a part in her decisions, and basically she said that wasn't true, um, but she said her overwhelming uh, emotion at the beginning of the pandemic was one of fear, that she was worried that... Uh, uh, there was a great risk of the country being overwhelmed. And as you saw, she was pretty emotional. She broke down again towards the end of her testimony this afternoon, uh, where she said she was deeply sorry to each and every bereaved person and relative and those who were hurt. But she and her government did their best uh, to, to serve the country. So there was a whole gamut of emotions from the Sturgeon all day. Uh, we saw part of that reputation she has of being a bit of an ice queen, where she's defended the reputation of her government. But we heard a lot of regret, a lot of contrition, a lot of admissions that they'd got things wrong. So it was a very, very different Nicola Sturgeon. I, as you've already pointed out, I think the families of the COVID bereaved, those people who died, particularly in care homes during the pandemic, albeit unhappy. I think there was a very short section at the end when she was questioned. Uh, she didn't give um, answers that I'm sure will satisfy them, but she did, as I say, apologise for that and has demonstrated some emotion and a human side round about it. Right, before I go to Isabel, I'd like to know, John, you've given us a, an excellent resume and praise of what she said and what she did, but what are your thoughts on that show of emotion? What are your thoughts on the level of contrition? What are your thoughts on her competence at the time? You know, we heard this phrase before, you know, the wrong person in the wrong job at the wrong time. Is that what she was or was she very zealous and vigorous in doing her best to divert from whatever Boris Johnson was doing and genuinely do what she thought best for Scotland? Do you think she did a creditable job? Do you think she's right to be sobbing? What do you think about her testimony today? I think that people will be judged on the outcomes of the pandemic. So despite the fact that Nicola Sturgeon appeared to have high levels of trust throughout the pandemic, certainly higher in Scotland than Boris Johnson, I think uh, as the pandemic has faded away and more knowledge has come about some of the decisions that have, have been taken, including at this inquiry, I think Nicola Sturgeon's reputation has been soured a bit. I think it would be fair to say that and that, uh, as well as a party. Um, I think, you know, the, the main thing today that we heard, because that issue of messages and minutes has dominated proceedings at the inquiry, um, I think the fact that she really confessed that she had deleted all her messages, she said uh, publicly, very publicly, in August 2021, that she would hand over all the evidence, including WhatsApps when it was clear, um, particularly under questioning from James Dawson, the KC, that she'd already deleted the messages. So I suspect that's the sort of thing that will be in the front pages of the papers tomorrow. Absolutely. Let me bring Isabel Oakeshott in on all of this. Obviously, she seems very emotional. She seems contrite. She says she did her very best. I mean, you know, no one had lived through a pandemic in our living memory before. I don't know what you make of this and whether you think there's any point in this inquiry anyway. Well, uh, on the second question, is there any point in this inquiry? There's much more point when all of those concerned are fully transparent and we get to see all those WhatsApps. As you know, I feel very strongly about this, yes. having released Matt Hancock's WhatsApps, and I think that has been um, hugely valuable to the inquiry, for the inquiry to see as many of those as possible. So it's a big shame um, that some members of the Scottish Government chose to delete their messages. Now, they've come up with all sorts of convoluted explanations as to why there's no, no nothing to hide, nothing mm. to see here. This was all just routine and people can make of that what they will. Um, I must say that having listened to Nicola Sturgeon all of today, I am going to give her the benefit of the doubt on her motivations. Um, yes, she was guilty, I think, of repeatedly politicising 
uh, and this is something she was pressed on all day. Did she take decisions simply to pursue uh, or, or, or partially to further the independence agenda? So Give not an example on... of how she might have done that, using COVID to do that, because Michael Gove has said, hasn't he, that Nicola Sturgeon used the pandemic to further the interests well, of, 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 of the SNP. A very simple example would yeah. be trying to get off the blocks with an announcement before the UK government did it, trying to go harder and faster and earlier than the UK government to look as if she was making big decisions, mm -hmm. taking the tough decisions when they were dithering. That's a simple example. But I think that it would probably be unfair um, to say that she, you know, that, that, to dispute um, her repeated claim in her evidence today that her primary objective at all times was to minimise loss and suffering from the pandemic. And I thought those tears were genuine. You know, she wasn't sobbing, she just was emotional. And I do think that that was genuine. You know, all these politicians, I happen to think they made some absolutely catastrophic mistakes. But I don't think many of them um, thought that any of this was anything other than utterly awful and bore the responsibility very, very heavily on their shoulders. Let me bring John Boothman back into this. Um, she faces claims, doesn't she, Nicola Sturgeon, that she held crucial gold command meetings without minutes. Now, talk to me about holding very important meetings and an incredibly pressurised time without minutes. Well, we found out more about these meetings today. We've heard these meetings previously were meetings between uh, selected on a rotating basis cabinet ministers in Scotland uh, with senior officials. Mostly they took place at the weekend. They took in, uh, place in advance of cabinet meetings. And Nicola Sturgeon tried to explain away today uh, why these meetings were not minuted. I said there was a note of them that were about action points that were passed around later. Um, but the fact is there were no minutes taken of these meetings. Uh, the fact is that, that so nothing was submitted. So we don't really know um, what happened at these meetings. She said that they were all about uh, discussing options that would then be put to Cabinet for decisions. Um, what we do know from testimony yesterday was that some ministers, including very important ones like the Finance Secretary Kate Forbes, weren't invited to the meetings. Yes. She didn't even know about it, despite the fact these meetings were taking place, despite the fact she was probably the third most important minister in the government. So I think that's something, particularly um, in the, the wake of her statement that she would pass on all documents, all emails, or WhatsApp messages to the inquiry, despite the fact she knew at that time there were going to be an inquiry, um, that she didn't actually do that. I mean, she deleted all her messages, and that she confessed today, after she had promised, of course, that she would hand them all over. All right, let, let me bring Isabel in on all of this. I mean, Gold Command meetings with no minutes, senior ministers not even told about these meetings, let alone invited to or included in them, and then all evidence that these meetings ever took place, or most of it, deleted. Now, as you quite rightly say, you are personally famous for many things, but one of them is exposing Matt Hancock's emails during the pandemic. You say that you consider it to be extremely important that you, you know, unleashed a whole kind of avalanche of information upon the public that otherwise we, ordinary people, would not have any damned idea at all about. So you did a big thing. It certainly had a big impact. When you hear about this, secret, incredibly important meetings with no minutes, evidence destroyed or whatever you want to call it, emails destroyed and various senior ministers not even being factored in, let alone in invited. What are the hackles that I'm quite sure must be rising? What does that indicate? Well, in a way, my hackles aren't rising because I'm so unsurprised, you know, because having seen from the inside how the normal business of government disintegrated, I'm not remotely surprised that key decisions were taken, basically stitched up amongst a few people. You know, they were making critical decisions from the moment they got up in the morning until very, very late at night. I mean, often after midnight. So in a sense, I'm not saying there's an excuse here, uh, but by way of pragmatic explanation, you know, they weren't sitting in the normal boardrooms and normal meeting rooms and normal cabinet rooms with a bunch of civil servants around them. Remember, most people were being told to work from home, so yeah. there actually weren't the teams. Uh, so on a practical note, you know, truthfully, a lot of decisions were being made by WhatsApp or very, very informal means. But, now, you, might, but you might say, and if they were 
even more was it important to make sure methodically everything was recorded, make sure it was on the record, make sure all the people who couldn't be there because they were working from home and were told not to come in knew what was happening. Make sure, let's face it, it was kosher, legit. You know, there was nothing done, being done on the fly, nothing on the sly, <laughs> nothing on the schneid, nothing that nobody would ever find out about and the good reason why they didn't find they, out was because nobody wanted them to know because it wasn't being done properly. They would say there just wasn't time and I, I, I'm slightly bewildered to find myself in any position of defending any administration yeah. in our country over this because shocking, shocking mistakes and errors of judgment were made. But when you've seen the exchanges that were going on, minute by minute decisions that had profound effects people on people's lives. Give people listening just an example, so randomly example, of what might have been shall decided. We, shall we shut schools tomorrow or not right you know and that could have been a decision that was whirring around government really late at night and oh what does the education secretary say what what's going on in scotland what's nicola saying and all of this is whizzing back and forth on whatsapp groups mm -hmm. how would they have managed it quickly if it wasn't informally are we suggesting um, that they should all have been locked in um, the government, the halls of government, like they no, locked us in our own homes. We know that Zoom works. We know that phones work. We know that texts work. We know that you can WhatsApp. I'm nobody saying anyone ought to be locked in, mm. and nobody's saying sit round a formal uh, boardroom table. Of course, we're not saying that. In fact, we weren't allowed to do that. We get that. But what I am saying, and and what I do feel uh, personally both incredulous about and horrified about is that because everything was being done so quickly and because it was so urgent and because there was no time for any of the normal constraints, restraints and, and hesitations and checks, I get that completely, that it wasn't meticulously recorded. So I think we can all so agree that on that. Could see. We can all agree on that. And I think we can also um, surmise that the result of this very informal decision making was an unprecedented concentration of power yeah. in the hands of a few people. Same north of the border, same in Scotland as it was uh, here yeah. in England, that a very small number of people came to have phenomenal control over our lives. And unfortunately, uh, wielding that control made some of the most dreadful errors of judgment. Let me bring John Boothman back in. Do you agree with Isabel's assessment of this, John? I don't think that's unreasonable. What I would say, of course, and this is a difficulty for Nicola Sturgeon in particular and the Scottish government, is that they said throughout the pandemic they were holier than thou and whiter than white and they were better than the UK government yes. at any of this stuff. True. And the fact of the matter is when you look at the outcomes, they weren't at all. Yeah. And the outcomes, are the outcomes uh, comparable in Scotland? Are they worse? Are they better? How do they compare? Um, the, the Scottish government would have had us believe that the outcomes were better. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, 17,000 plus people passed away during the pandemic, huge numbers of people um, in care homes in particular. And the people who will be most dissatisfied with today's evidence are the relatives of all those people who died or who were hurt during the pandemic. Yes, let's talk about the release of elderly people uh, into care homes and from straight from hospital. So, you know, we had the same thing uh, in, in the rest of the United Kingdom. But, but has, has Nicola Sturgeon had anything to say about that? Well, right at the very end uh, of the session today, only for half an hour, hence I think uh, those relatives that I've mentioned a couple of times are not going to be satisfied at all. There were questions asked, and in particular, there were questions asked about the lack of testing capacity in Scotland, which was only 350 or something when the pandemic started. And of course, that huge, huge issue as to why people were discharged from hospital untested and into care homes, which people who are relatives um, of, of people who died believed was a huge factor in what happened to them. So that was raised at the end of the session today. I think we'll probably hear more of that in future sessions of the UK COVID inquiry. But I think, again, that's something we're going to be reading about um, from the relatives of the bereaved tomorrow in the newspapers. All right, Isabel, she says, Nicola Sturgeon, what she regrets more than anything is not locking the country down sooner, either a week or two weeks earlier than she did. When you hear that, what do you think? Well, you know my views on this. I mean, I am very sceptical about the merits of <coughs> lockdown. I think in the early, in the first outbreak of the pandemic, it was absolutely legitimate and, and wise. 
uh, to shut up shop whilst we figured out what was going on. I don't think that there's very much compelling evidence that shutting up shop several weeks earlier would have somehow prevented the run of this disease. Unfortunately, it has proven impossible to, as Nicola Sturgeon was trying to do, eliminate it. Much was made today as to whether she was really trying to eliminate it or eradicate it. And I'm sure people at home will be wondering, what on earth is the difference? Yeah, I'm trying to think what's the yeah, difference. Yeah, and she was repeatedly pressed on this and she sort of danced on a pinhead and tried to claim that she didn't really think she could wipe it off the face of the earth. This was all about containing it. And when she said she wanted to eliminate it, what she really meant is keep it under control. Uh, look, at the end of the day, COVID is still with us. Mm. Uh, we've learned to live with it. Luckily, there are vaccines for the most vulnerable. Um, and, and, and that's that, really. Thank you both very much indeed. Good to have you on the programme.